edition of the, the Jones Seminar. Today our speaker is a faculty candidate in the energy area, uh, Brendan Epps, who is coming to us uh, from MIT. Uh, he, he has got his breath, I think, from uh, running the marathon on Monday in Boston. Uh, for, uh, and it was a personal victory for him. He, he beat his own best time at the marathon from uh, previous uh, runs in that race. Uh, if we go back a little further in time, we find him at Carnegie Mellon, where he got his uh, BS in mechanical engineering uh, before working uh, for a couple of years for the Ford Motor Company as a, an engineer, uh, a development engineer. And then he decided that uh, he would uh, seek additional degrees, and for that went to MIT, where he got his MS and PhD degrees uh, in the last few years and has been employed uh, since then at the MIT Sea Grant program. And uh, during that time, he has been working on uh, effic energy efficient propulsion, including learning of fish swim. And uh, most of his applications have been in the area of, well, you guessed it, it's here, uh, propellers and turbines, both uh, with uh, water and wind turbine applications. Uh, without further ado, I'll leave the floor to Brendan. <coughs> All right. Can you hear me on the microphone? I think I turn it on, okay. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, it's been a warm welcome here, so I feel right at home at Dartmouth. Thanks for uh, making me feel so uncomfortable and welcome here. Um, so like Benoit said, I, I, I did my undergrad at Carnegie Mellon. I went to MIT for my master's degree. Uh, he pretty much just went all through all this, uh, all this text on the screen, so maybe we could just look at some of the pictures. Uh, this uh, video that's playing is from uh, a video that the Department of Undergrad Education at MIT made showing off some of the labs that I had created for an undergrad hydrodynamics class. Um, that was really fun and uh, certainly the type of thing that I'd love to do here at Dartmouth. Um, these images here can uh, summarize a little bit about my, my PhD thesis. I was working in an experimental hydrodynamics lab and I created a, a framework for doing a force analysis of various uh, hydrodynamics problems, and so I applied that to looking at uh, efficient propulsion of fish, also this uh, problem of water entry of spheres, and then also the design of marine propellers and hydrokinetic turbines. So that's, that's me in the, in the, uh, the water tunnel. You might re recall that, how it looks. Uh, we just talked about it. Um, some of the pictures on the bottom are kind of things from my personal life. Um, this is uh, from scuba diving with my wife. Uh, she's the one in the back. Um, this is us cooking and uh, this was after a 20 point, so the fingers are 20.3 mile a day we hiked on the long trail just down the street. So she was pretty proud of that. Um, I had through hiked the Appalachian Trail before going to grad school. So I don't know if anybody recognizes this sign, but this is on the top of Mount, yeah, we've got, we got, got a nod there. This is the top of Mount Musilaki just up the road. Um, and then this is a picture of me running the marathon last year. Um, so I work for C Grant, uh, the Sea Grant College Program office at MIT. Sea uh, Grant is a national uh, lab program. We have 32 labs at various colleges and universities around the country, uh, including MIT. Um, the, the unique thing about MIT Sea Grant is that um, in addition to doing biological ocean-related research, like all Sea Grant uh, offices do, we also build underwater robots. So, uh, this reef explorer had been in Hawaii for several years doing uh, exploration out there. Um, this video playing shows the sea perch robots, and this is a K through 12 outreach program that that we've put together over a number of years. Um, and the idea is that this little PVC robot costs about $75 for the kit of parts, and then we give the uh, K through 12 educators. Um, learning uh, curriculum materials so they can go and teach their classes how to build this and teach them about underwater robots and science and exploration of the oceans. Um, some of the things that I've been doing uh, while at Sea Grant have been more uh, marine propulsion related. So I've been doing CFD work and looking at uh, marine propellers and propeller design for the Navy. Um, in particular, I've been working on the, uh, the DDG-1000 all-electric ship project so the idea there is that the Navy wants to replace the gas turbine engines that drive the propellers with electric engines. So that way, uh, when, the, when the propellers are not running at full steam, 
you can maybe shut down one of the electric generators on board the ship and save some fuel. <clears throat> so we've built a scale model. This is a 15-foot model of the DDG-51 hull. And uh, we've outfitted it in the back with, with a glass window, so that way we can do propeller design and we can um, do flow field imaging through the window and see uh, what's going on with the, with the propeller uh, flow um, as we do maneuvering tests and other kind of propulsion tests. And this image is just from, uh, this, would be a, this is a test we're about to do next week, uh, testing uh, bow thrusters for large cruise ships. So that's a little bit about me. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk to you today, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about wind energy. So the first part of my talk, I'll give you a little bit of a brief overview of wind energy uh, as a whole and um, some, some of the issues facing our, our country and, and the world. Um, and then I'll tell you about this uh, open prop design code that I've written, that I wrote as a grad student and uh, that I've been maintaining as a postdoc. And then we'll put that together uh, with some aeroelastic um, uh, turbine modeling work that I'll talk about um, at the end. And that's really what I'm proposing to do as, as one of the main projects here at Thayer. <clears throat> All right, so I like to call this the spaghetti slide. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen this chart before, but this, OK, a lot of nods. OK, a lot, everyone's seen it. OK, everyone's seen it. So I don't have to explain this. This, uh, this is saying you know, these are all the sources of energy, and these are all the end uses we have. And a couple of key things to point out as far as uh, this talk is concerned is, um, first of all, if you just ask, you know, how many wind turbines would we need in the country to provide all of the electric needs uh, we have for the whole country? The answer is, well, we need about 424 gigawatt years. So we need 424 gigawatts of power continuously uh, being made for the entire year, and that will give us enough energy uh, to power all the uh, electricity needs for residential, commercial, uh, and industrial applications. You'll notice that. Um, none of this electricity is currently going into transportation because we don't have electric cars uh, currently on the road. Uh, so if electric cars were really going to be, become uh, something that had a national presence, you know, some of this energy from petroleum would, would go away. We'd have some more electricity needing to go into uh, transportation. So that might make the uh, demands a little bit higher for electricity. Um, a couple things. A couple other uh, points to be made. Um, the end use here is 80% efficient, so there's lots of work being done uh, in, in research labs across the country on how to make uh, end use of various products uh, and buildings and homes more efficient. So that's what that is all trying to aim at, is increasing this number from 80% up to 100. Uh, transportation is 25% efficient, so that's you know, accounting from everything from your car not getting good gas mileage to your uh, the tires not being pumped up very well and, and other things. So um, if we were to go with electric vehicles, then maybe we would gain a little bit because uh, generation of elect power, electric power is, is a little bit more efficient than burning uh, gas in an in internal combustion engine. But we'd still have various uh, transmission uh, issues. Um, does anybody know, did it, does anybody know that um, in, in 1900, they actually had electric cars in Boston. Okay, okay. I'm not telling anybody you get anything you guys don't know already. Do you know? Do you know why they don't? It, they they uh, got I phased out. Another, uh, I mean, the, the garbage trucks and ferries that were probably still are running on batteries. Okay, so um, okay, so long history of electric vehicles here. So they did have electric vehicles in Boston. You could drive right to government center and get your battery changed in 30 seconds. But unfortunately, those batteries uh, weighed too much, and they didn't have enough energy density. So when gasoline came along and really made the gasoline engines uh, reliable, uh, the, the, they, they really, the, the electric cars just couldn't compete anymore. And we still see that today, 100 years later, with gasoline continuing to be the best way to transport energy in, in an automobile. So it's really people working on batteries for automobiles. It's an important thing. And once we, once we do have that demand, we are going to need a lot more electricity. So we would need more wind turbines. OK, so let's talk about wind power overview. Uh, these maps on the left show the wind resource in the country. Remember we said we needed about 424 gigawatt years of electricity uh, continuous. So how many gigawatts can we get? Well, 
There's a lot more than that to be had. If we covered the entire United States with, with wind turbines, we could have 10,000 gigawatts. That's really not practical because we all like to have a house and we don't like to live on top of wind turbines. So, um, yeah, I, I, like, I like to think that we could uh, put wind turbines offshore on floating offshore platforms. It's a little bit hard to see um, here, but uh, there is a, a huge potential. The red is right at the top of the list. So there's a huge potential, especially in New England, uh, for, for having uh, offshore wind. And with the 4,000 gigawatts of power that are available in the United States, we could easily power the entire country on wind power you know, if we get around the other issues of intermittent wind uh, and uh, energy storage and so on. And there'd be good people at Cape Cod. But, but that's why we need to do you know, floating turbines offshore, because then we can put it far enough offshore that those good people have nothing to complain about anymore. Um, you know, the other, the other uh, point to be made is that if you look at where the people are, the people are clustered on the coasts and on the Great Lakes, where we have you know, a nice offshore wind uh, potential. So I, think, I, I really think offshore wind is, is one way to go. To, get, to make electricity where the people are and where we need it. Um, this graph shows installed power in our country versus time, showing a, you know, a large increase in the last four years of installed power. If you've flown to California in the last year, you've probably seen wind turbines blanketing the, the Midwest. Um, so certainly a lot of activity in this, uh, in this sector right now. <clears throat> OK. so. Let's look, up, look at the physics just a little bit. I'll try to intersperse math uh, you know, d uh, politely through the, through the talk. So you only have to sit through one slide of math now, and then we'll get some smart pictures. But we do need to learn, you know, learn about you know, how do wind turbines work in order to really understand this talk. Okay, so, so when we talk about um, uh, wind power or hydrokinetic power, what we're talking about is siphoning out the kinetic energy from the, the, the moving fluid. So we have um, clouds blowing wind. Clouds blow wind, if you didn't know that. Um, and they, so they make an inflow of you know, some speed v, and it goes through the wind turbine of some area A. And then down downstream of the wind turbine, the wind is slowed down. So we just had a, Chris and I had a, or Charles and I had a great uh, conversation this morning, uh, noting that if the turbine slows down the wind completely, uh, then the velocity downstream would be zero, and all the wind would pile up, and you couldn't have any more flow through. So that's not possible. You can't siphon out all the kinetic energy. But if you don't siphon out any, and this is the same speed as above, then, then you haven't gotten any power out. So there is some optimum uh, best you know, amount of, of energy to extract uh, in order to have the optimized turbine. And, and that's called the Betts limit, and that's 59%. So, so you know, the mass flow rate through the wind turbine is given by, the, you know, by that. The kinetic energy flow rate is just 1 half mv squared. Um, and then the, so the actual power you're going you're gonna to extract is just the power coefficient times this available kinetic energy. So the power coefficient you can think about as an efficiency or characterizing your wind turbine, where the maximum efficiency you can possibly get is 59%. Actual wind turbines, like full-scale wind turbines, like this uh, Vestas V80 uh, turbine, uh, get about 50%, which is pretty good. Um, I'll show you some, some results later showing, showing how good that just is. Um, but that's not, that's not where it stops. The actual output power you get from the machine, you know, there's also a generator efficiency. And there's also this thing called the capacity factor. And what that takes into account is the fact that um, you know, while here, so wind power here would go up like the cube of the, of the wind speed. And so for the, some, you know, for slow winds, we can get all 50% um, of that out. So this is all 50%, 50%. But once you get to the rated wind speed, then um, the, the, the machine, for structural reasons, will not uh, siphon off any more power than, than, the, than the rated power. So for structural reasons, you know, we, don't, we, we can't let the, the loads on the blades go too high, so we, we cap the, the, the maximum power we're going to extract at the rated power. <clears throat> and so this capacity factor accounts for the time spent uh, not getting the full 50% out. Um, another point to be made is you can, you can beat this Betts limit if you have a ducted turbine. So here's an exploded view of a turbine 
uh, where we have this, this duct. Uh, we actually have a, a contra-rotating stage here, and this would all be compressed into this, uh, into this duct. So we're mixing, mixing some of the free stream flow with some of the flow that had gone through the turbine stage. And that's a way to, 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 to beat this BETS limit. Um, so that, that would be a good, uh, good thing to do in, in, say, a river application where you could have a, a much smaller diameter machine. But certainly for these uh, big, massive turbines, I don't think putting a duct around those is going to be very effective. Yeah, yeah, the the the, the stresses in these blades and in the in the gearbox, the drive, the whole drivetrain. I, I don't think so. Yeah, so that's so that's so they limit the power. And this is all, another way you can you know, you're delivering constant power to the grid for for this range of wind speeds. So in an offshore application where the wind might be fluctuating between 15 and 25 you know, meters per second over the whole day, you, you would be delivering a constant power to the grid. So um, that would be one way to avoid ener having energy storage, but still you know, being able to interface with the utility grid. No, the bets the bets limit is purely uh, the, the purely um, you know uh, physics just from the flowing uh, the the mass flow rate and the kinetic energy flow rate through the f through the propeller disc. So you can't improve the making a You the only way to get around the bets limit is to put a duct with and and even then you're not really getting around the bets limit you're just Augmenting the mass flow rate given the given the duct, and so you still see so you, you you're cheating in a sense of having a larger mass flow rate for the same diameter. So, so um, you know, if you so the the, same, the 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 simple idea is if you if you don't slow the, the fluid down at all, you're not sucking out any power, and if you suck out all the power by slowing down the fluid completely, you get no mass flow rate, so you don't have any any kinetic energy flowing through your disc, so that's impossible. But all those other factors then come in the, into this 40% thing. Um, all the other factors you know, come into, the, into these percents. You know, like 50, okay. you know, 50 percent is still not 59. There's still 9 percent better you could theoretically get. Um, all right. And then the other point is that you know, if, you do, if you operate in air, you have a density of about 1. And if you operate in water, you have a density of 1,000 times that. So, that's why you know marine current turbines and tidal turbines are are particularly attractive uh, source of energy because you can have much smaller machines a thousand times the the fluid density means you can have a tenth uh, of, of the of the diameter or square root of square root of uh, square root of a thousand or you can have a tenth of the speed um, and then and then you can have the same power output All right so let's move on. So various types of wind turbines that exist. Uh, I think we've seen most of these. So on the left are horizontal axis propeller type. So these are the type I'll talk about today. Um, in the faculty lunch talk yesterday, I, I mentioned these Darius crossflow wind turbines um, as another active field of research. I think this, this image was just photoshopped. I don't think this actually exists anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, and then these uh, Savonius are also crossflow turbine uh, types. This is just an anemometer that measures wind speed that's been around for years. Um, and then this, this is just like a coffee can cut in half and then glued, you know, bolted together. This is a really simple geometry. It could be made with simple materials. This could be, could be the kind of thing you could, uh, you could bring to a third world country where you could say, you know, given some simple parts, we can you know, construct this and you can use that to power, uh, power you know, pumping water to the village or something. <clears throat> All right, so just, uh, you know, also to give you some reference of the sizes of these machines, some products that are available on the market today. Uh, this is uh, one of the largest wind turbines on the market. This is the GE um, uh, 3.6 megawatt turbine, and it's in the, uh, uh, the Arklow Bank offshore wind facility off the coast of, um, I think it's Ireland or Scotland, somewhere like that. Um, you can see these huge blades. The, uh, the, the rotor diameter is 341 feet, so that's the entire length of a football field plus the end zones. 
and a little bit of painted lines on either side. And, and you can contrast that with this small little turbine that only makes 20 kilowatts. Um, this company's reason for being, you, you just saw in that video, they hinge the turbine up into place. So their shtick is that they have really fast installation and it's really easy for them to install their turbine at your site. It makes it really low cost um, and, and attractive for things like schools and, and small businesses. <clears throat> All right, so, so that's a little bit of an overview of, of wind energy and where the industry is right now. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about this open prop design code that I had made when I was, when I was a graduate student. Um, you might ask, you know, why am I talking about propellers? I thought we were talking about wind turbines. Um, well, a propeller and a turbine, you know, the horizontal axis turbines, they're all, they're all the same thing. They're all rotors. So here I brought, I brought some. These are actually uh, left-hand threads, which means the, the writing here is on the upstream side. So if you put your left hand, uh, it's a left-hand roll. You put your left hand uh, with your thumb facing upstream, and your fingers curl in the direction that the thing rotates. So this thing rotates to the left as it goes upstream. And then you can kind of see that the blades are, are, are pitched so that they cut through the water you know, just at that right pitch angle. And then if you look real closely, you can see that the blades are somewhat cupped like this. So the suction side is facing upstream. Um, in contrast, uh, this one's also left, uh, left hand thread, so it's also going to go like this. Um, but in contrast, this turbine has the, the, the blades cupped you know, facing downstream. So the suction side's on the downstream side. Um, so I'll pass these around, and you can take a look. Well, they're just different machines. One, the propeller is putting energy into the fluid, and the turbine's taking energy out. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, so I have another one in my pocket here. I'll so I just follow along. Um, so, <laughs> so okay. So, um, so if you look at this, you know, simplified force diagram, in 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 the in the in the reference frame. Uh, we're talking about here, uh, I've drawn right-hand thread propellers. So um, in a reference frame where the propeller blade section is, is stationary, so here's a stationary blade section. The, the, the fluid's approaching it, coming down the screen. And then instead of this thing rotating, we're just having the fluid come in from the side. So that makes, that makes a pitch angle of the inflow beta. The, the propeller blade has a certain angle of attack to that, so it makes a certain loading. And given that loading, you get a lift. And if you just project the lift into the axial and tangential directions, you get thrust and torque. The, the, the wind turbine works exactly the same way, except for this angle of attack is negative, And this curvature is now negative, which makes a negative um, circulation, a negative lift, just going in the opposite direction. And so then the torque goes in the opposite direction. So you know, now that you know, if you're comfortable with just having a bunch of negative signs floating around, you can use the same exact, uh, same exact code to represent both horizontal axis turbines and propellers. <clears throat> so how, how might we model these things? Um, there's a range of modeling methods you could do to analyze this type of problem. The one I'll talk about uh, today is the lifting line method. This is the most simple method you can do to, to model these things. Um, and I think least accurate is actually maybe, maybe a little bit of a misnomer, because you'll see some of the results I'll show today are pretty quite accurate. Uh, the fast, uh, this is certainly the fastest way. And also, just given the, the, those really basic you know, diagrams on the last slide, we now have a pretty good understanding of how the pitch of the blades and how the load distribution, that circulation distribution, would affect the lift and the thrust and torque that we're producing. So because we have such a simplified model, we can now use these lifting line methods to do design optimization and parametric design studies. And that's a, one way we can really hone in on the best part of the design space to be uh, working in. Uh, that's typically what's done by the, by the Navy and other people designing propellers. So they, they'd use this kind of lifting line formulation to do a design and then use a, a lifting surface or panel method to just tweak that final you know, couple percent out of the geometry and, and get the geometry exactly how you want. I've used CFD and, and experiments really as um, analysis tools, uh, verifying your design performs how you want it to, um, and not really viewing them as design tools per se, because it takes, uh, it takes too long to, be, to do those types of analyses. 
uh, to really have them be useful for, say, a parametric design study. <coughs> All right, so this is, the, this is the graphical user interface of the OpenProp design code. <coughs> um, users can, uh, so this is just set up for a, for a propeller right now. You can enter in the number of blades and the rotation speed and the thrust you want. Uh, this has various geometric parameters of the, um, of, the of the blades, such as the chord distribution. And what I mean by that is this, this chord length as a function of radius. So that's, that's one given you need to put into the, to the code. Uh, another given you would have to put in would be the thickness of the blade as, as a function of radius. And those things you, you would want to vary and, and see how, the, um, you know, how they affect your parametric design study. Um, so given those things, you can, you can do a design, you get the geometry out, you get the performance uh, out. One unique thing about, about uh, my software is that, that it can also do an off-design performance prediction. So this is the entire performance curve for this propeller operating over a wide range of rotation speeds and, uh, and inflow speeds. <clears throat> so this lets you do system-level design where you could use this software to uh, create the propulsor for, for your um, entire ship or underwater vehicle. Um, I, I also want to mention that you know, this, is open, so this is an open source project. It's been online for a few years now. Uh, and the last time I gave this talk, we had 11,000 visitors. I checked last night, we have now 13,800 visitors to the site. So um, that's better than any of the papers I've written. You know, a lot more. <laughs> more citations than any of my papers. I get emails all the time. I have two emails in my inbox right now from various from users of the code. Um, you know, some are students asking me if you know, help them with their theses. This is a professor at the Navy Postgraduate School just saying he uses the code in his class. Um, and then just random people. So he says he's a crazy open prop fan. So I like that guy. Um, a, t a typical lifting line code will just have basic functionality. If, you know, certain design inputs like ro thrust and rotation speed. And what it'll do is calculate um, the optimum load distribution to give you the most efficient propeller. Maybe it can spit out a crude blade geometry. OpenProp can do that and a whole lot more. Uh, we can also spit out the uh, files to, to, to make CAD models, which is what I did to make those uh, 3D printed pr prototypes. Uh, we also. Uh, since I'm working on CFD, I've made the files to interface with the CFD codes. Um, and then the big, the big thing is that it can do this off-design performance prediction. I'll tell you how that works in, in, in uh, two slides. So then we can get this performance curves. I've also advised some, other, uh, some master's students. One of them uh, made a blade stress analysis routine. So given the, given the loading on the blade, you can calculate the stresses um, and, and understand the fatigue loading of the blades. Um, another student uh, that I advised made a, a blade cavitation uh, subroutine. And cavitation, um, that's a whole tangent. I won't get into that. That's, you don't want cavitation. It'll ruin your blades. So, uh, but, so now we can predict that. <clears throat> so all right, so we have two slides of math, then we'll get back to the fun stuff. Um, so now we have, we'll peel back the onion one more layer, you know, one more layer. And if we don't cry, then we'll learn a little bit more about how this works. Um, so now I've, I've redrawn this velocity triangle, but I've added a couple more things. So we still have the axial inflow. We still have this apparent rotational inflow, making some baseline inflow angle. These two, in, these two velocities I've drawn here are the, the, the induced velocities. So that because of the propeller is operating, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, um, it's gonna be uh, inducing flow on itself uh, from its wake. And so this is what we're talking about with the, with the wind turbine. The wind turbine can't completely stop the fluid. It's got to only stop it a little bit. And what we mean by that is that this axial-induced velocity can't be 100% of this uh, inflow speed. It has to be only some percentage of this. <clears throat> um, OK, so given all these velocities, you can compute this velocity triangle. We still have some angle of attack, so we get some loading, and that makes lift. And then that makes, um, uh, and then if you also have uh, you also have friction drag of the of the uh, of the fluid going past the blades, so you have some drag. So your total force now is F, and you can just do the sine and the cosine of the lift and drag, and then get your your thrust and torque if you integrate over the whole uh, length of the blade. 
So the torque, yeah, both both the thrust and torque include the lift component and the drag component, you know, with the right trigonometry involved. Um, okay, yeah, and this is all pretty standard stuff. This is uh, you can find this all in uh, the current uh, principles of naval architecture book, uh, written by Jake Kerwin. I helped I helped edit this book. Uh, I was one of the technical editors, so I can personally guarantee that all the equations are correct. <laughs> Or, or let me say it this way. If you find an equation in there that's not correct, I'll give you 10 bucks. So, um, OK, so, uh, oh yeah, so, so again, you know, because this, uh, so, so two more things about this slide. Basically, this, this is pretty easy. Once, once you know this velocity triangle, then you know the loads, and you're all done. Um, but this is, a, this is a, a bit of a nonlinear problem, because given this certain inflow, Angle beta i, the model is that the wake then you know, is constructed by we have a helical wake coming off of each of the propeller blades, and the pitch of this of these helic of these helices are given by this beta i, and then because of this geometry and the loading on the blade, this circulation loading on the blade, then we induce certain inflow speeds. But then given the inflow speeds, then we have a different beta i. So we have to solve for beta i, the inflow speeds, and the circulation all at the same time to have a physically realistic scenario. <clears throat> OK. Um, so, so in the, in the uh, let me go one slide back. Um, so in, in designing propellers, the, 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 the design problem is pretty easy. You would, would optimize your load distribution, your circulation distribution over the whole span of the blade, such that you would um, arrive at your prescribed thrust for your ship, but minimize your torque. Um, you could also, and that, that would, the minimum torque would give you the minimum uh, you know, power input into the propeller, and that would give you the maximum efficiency. You could also set up the uh, design optimization where you have a specified torque and you just want to maximize your thrust. And that's what we do for designing underwater vehicles. <clears throat> for the turbine, you don't really care so much about the thrust. You just want to maximize your torque. So all of these types of you know, turbine and propeller optimization routines uh, you, can, you can do. Um, and then it comes to off-design analysis. All right, so this is the last, this is the last slide of math. And we'll get back to some, some graphs and, 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 and pictures. <clears throat> so given, given uh, Given your design, you know the slow distribution, and then you can you can figure out how your your propeller or your turbine is going to perform off design if you put in a different rotation speed. So if you give it a different rotation speed, then you need to have all of these things in your velocity triangle still still be in in physical agreement. So um, the hypotenuse, the star, the angle of attack, alpha, the lift coefficient, the circulation, these induced velocities, and so on. All have to be physically realistic you know, and, and consistent with one another. Um, we can solve this by setting up a, a Newton solver, which is a pretty simple uh, mathematical numerical technique. I see some people shaking their heads yes. The picture in one dimension is just if you have a curve or you're trying to find where the curve intersects zero, then you have certain guesses for where it, what the, you know, the x's are. And then once you get to the right x, then, then the residual equations all equal zero. So what this means for this multidimensional problem is you want V star to equal all these things, where you take V star and you, these induced velocities as unknowns. And then each iteration of the Newton solver, you're guessing new values of each of these three things to hopefully arrive at you know, a consistent set of values. <clears throat> all right, so you might ask, how well does that work? Here's some validation data for US Navy Propeller 4119. <clears throat> Um, the, so on the, on the right here, I'm showing the circulation distribution as a function of radius. The blue curve uh, with the dots on it are the open prop predictions. The black, uh, or the black uh, dashed line is the, the Navy's best code, PBD14. So it gives almost the same exact answer. And then the data, these x's are experimental data showing you know, pretty good agreement. <clears throat> this is the, the entire performance curve showing the thrust and the torque and the efficiency as a function of advanced coefficient. Advanced coefficient is like a non-dimensional rotation rate. So as the propeller uh, rotates faster, then this advanced coefficient goes slower. And if, as, it, as the propeller uh, rotates slower, this advanced coefficient 
um, increases. So we see really good agreement between the open prop predictions and the experimental data for a whole wide range. So even though this code runs really fast, it's also very accurate, and we can use it. Um, and we, so now we can use it for system level design. <clears throat> so in particular, uh, this underwater vehicle was being made by, uh, by a group that wanted to do some ocean mapping. And so what they wanted to do is map as much of the ocean as possible you know, with every, every time they deploy the vehicle. So they, just wanted, they wanted the maximum efficiency out of their propulsion system possible. <clears throat> Using OpenProp, you can investigate things like, uh, what, if, what if we start with this baseline 4119 propeller, and then we just cut the cord lengths in half? How are, how's that going to affect our efficiency? Well, here you can see that the efficiency increases by about 5% by cutting these, these cord lengths in half and having smaller blades. <clears throat> And then you can use the, the blade stress and the cavitation routines that my students had made to check and see, you know, will this blade still work or, or will it not, will it break or will it cavitate? And what, they, what these people found was that this blade's still going to work, and so that's the one that they built, and I think that's the one that's, that's flying on their machine now. So this is a good example of you know, system-level design work that you can do. You know, because you have this parametric design tool, that will allow you to rapidly iterate between different, um, different uh, designs. All right, so what about turbines? We're talking, talking a lot about propellers, so what about turbines? <clears throat> this graph shows the power coefficient as a function of, of tip speed ratio for several different turbines designed each for this, these particular tip speed ratios and then amounts of drag. So, um, and then also numbers of blades. So we have many, many different points on, the, on, on these many, many different curves. Each point on each curve represents a different turbine design. And it took, in the time it takes you to like go up and get a cup of coffee and come back, then the code will have this all done. And you will have mapped out the entire design space. So <clears throat> again, this tip speed ratio is like a non-dimensional rotation speed. So as we go to the right on this graph, we're rotating faster. As we go to the left on the graph, we're rotating slower. So if your wind turbine doesn't rotate at all, then you get no power out. And then you can see that for these cases where, the, where there's some drag, um, then there's going to be some best rotation speed. And if you rotate too fast, then the drag's just going to start killing you, and you're not going to be making as much power as you could. Um, that Renewergy company that I told you about earlier has a, a huge tip speed ratio. They're way out here at like 15 or something. So uh, I told them, you guys should probably cut your, cut your rotation speed in half and get back onto this curve. And you get back into the more of the sweet spot of where you should be designing your turbine. <clears throat> the industry state of the art, they have, um, they've been doing a lot of work on des designing blade sections that have very low drag for, and high lift. And so you can see that um, if you look, compare these three different curves, you can see that you know, as you get less, less drag, you approach uh, a, a certain limit here. The bets limit, this 59%, is the, is the, is the theoretical limit uh, in, the, in the case of one-dimensional flow. All of these curves you know, are, are giving you pa power coefficients less than the bets limit because, the, because of the rotation of the machine. And, and, and that introduces swirl into the, into the wake, which accounts for some of the kinetic energy lost into the swirl of the wake, which couldn't recover uh, as electricity produced by your turbine. <clears throat> so, point being that you can use this to do very rapid par parametric design studies. Um, another example would be the same kind of uh, idea we had before of looking at various cord lengths. So here's a particular design and with the green, uh, the green cord lengths outlined here. If you double the, the cord lengths, then you, you would have a turbine uh, which would perform like this blue curve. And if you do half the cord lengths, then you have a little bit higher performance at the design point, but then the performance would fall off as, as your wind speed or rotation speed changes. So <clears throat> the point of this slide is that not only can you explore what's happening at the design point here, but you get your entire performance curve so you can see how design changes would affect the operation of your whole, whole machine over a wide range of wind speeds. Here's some data showing the uh, validation of, of, of this code and method for, for a turbine. Uh, here's a little turbine I had tested 
Um, so I had done one test. That my, da my data is the red X's. At the same time, I was advising a student making this much better test fixture. His data is in the, uh, in, in the black triangles. And that agrees quite well with the open prop predictions, especially here in this region where um, for these low tip speed ratios, these are very slow rotation speeds. That's when the turbine starts to experience stall. And that's, that's actually the sweet spot of where a lot of turbines are designed. They're designed to stall regulated machines. So if the wind blows a little bit faster relative to the rotation speed of the turbine, then what happens is you creep over here into stall. The blades don't get overload, uh, overloaded, and the machine is able to continue operating without breaking. So we're able to um, capture that behavior quite well with this model. Um, let's zoom out a little bit. Now that we've done all this work to understand how to make this code, and, uh, and we've done all the work of validating the code, let's zoom out a little bit and then use it to do something useful. Um, so this map shows <clears throat> the um, Cape Cod Canal here. This is, uh, this is, the, the, R, this is the, the start of Cape Cod. If you've ever driven to Cape Cod, you probably got stuck in traffic on the Sagamore Bridge right here. <clears throat> this, this tidal uh, estuary has you know, very regular tides and um, maximum flow speeds of about four knots, which is not very fast, but we could still uh, design an array of small turbines that we could put in the water there and uh, maybe power some of these, uh, you know, maybe power the, the, the red lights on the Sagamore Bridge or something. Yeah. So, um, so, so we could approximate the, uh, the, the tidal flow as being somewhat sinusoidal with, the, with this four knot amplitude. And again, using open prop, we could design a, a turbine which has maybe 50% efficiency. And then given a gearbox efficiency of 85%, then we would get uh, this, this turbine power out, which, it, which it is going to go like velocity cubed. So that's going to also that's going to be like a sinusoidal uh, cubic sinusoidal. So now we arrive at another uh, another issue of doing this this tidal power, which is that um, the required power to power all the stoplights on the Sagamore Bridge might be 20 kilowatts, and on average we're we're producing 20 kilowatts, but we're going to need some storage for some part of the day in order to to um, store the power so we can use it at other parts of the day. So, you know. This is not just a, a fluid mechanics issue. This is a whole system issue. This is an issue of um, integrating to the entire uh, utility infrastructure. Um, but this is just one piece of the bigger puzzle. All right, so let's move on to aeroelastic modeling. You guys have been so patient. I think I'll, we'll, oh, let's stop this thing. All right, go back. All right, yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. I, I've improved on that. I haven't released that the new theory manual yet because I have a paper that's in review, and I want to get the reviews back before. Um, yeah, the, I, I'll be happy to talk about that after. But that's, um, if you basically in the old method, what what people have done in the past is, if you only try to maximize torque of your turbine without any other constraint, then you'll arrive at this incorrect result of a 0.5 induction factor, whereas um, if, you, if you use the proper constraints on the wake, then you'll get the correct induction factor, which is a third. And so I didn't, I didn't put that out online open source yet, because that, that results in review. Um, but I guess if you put this, this talk uh, online, then the cat's going to be out of the bag. Are there any other questions before we destroy this turbine? Yeah. Um, so you're ignoring the, 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 the precise geometry of the blades themselves. You're, you're relating the, the, the lift and the loading created by the, the particular geometry um, uh, by, by taking the two-dimensional um, airfoil performance and then, and then um, stacking that one on top of the other to get you know, your whole radial distribution of, of loading. What actually happens when you have a when you have a rotor is that there are lifting surface effects. So your performance in two dimensions is not going to be quite the performance in three dimensions. 
So you would use, use a lifting surface or a, or a panel method code in order to do that next level of analysis. Those are the type of boundary element methods that, uh, that I was talking about yesterday. And I, I, I have those codes, they're just not you know, part of this talk, no, so per se. Yeah, so so the, the 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 shape gets buried into um, how you relate the angle of attack and the pitch of the blade and the and the camber of the blade, the curvature of the blade, to the the lift coefficient that it makes and ultimately the, the circulation loading that it makes. So like it's it's a little bit buried in the model. Um, Is it at all analogous to doing something like a Fourier transform? Uh, not really. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. How many more minutes do we have? All right, this thing's about to get destroyed. Um, you know, I don't know the circumstance of, of why this was. Certainly, for somebody to put a camera here, they had to know this was going to be destroyed. But it's it's kind of dramatic. So I think it's you know at this point in the talk, fun to watch. So you know, in designing turbines, we're trying to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, so, so like I said, we, we need to um, put turbines offshore. And if you look at this map, it shows depth of the water um, you know, at various places on the, on the eastern seaboard. And, and here, a lot of this stuff is green. That's deep water. That's, that's more than 60 meters deep where we need these floating offshore wind turbines. All right, so what are some of the loads on offshore wind turbines? Well, we have unsteady turbulent wind with some you know, crazy velocity profile. Uh, we have gyroscopic loads of the blades rotating, gravitational inertia loads, dynamic loads, buoyancy, wave loads, waves slamming against the structure, mooring line things. This is a very complicated nonlinear problem. Um, and a lot of people have given a lot of attention to this um, over the years. But there's certainly a lot more work to be done. Some, some uh, quick dimensional analysis gives us a sense of uh, why, why we might need uh, simulation tools. Um, so given, given length, uh, well, the length scale is the diameter of your machine. Um, in, in, in wind, which has the same density, and, and you know, so in a certain wind and, and uh, conditions where you have air density and velocity of the wind, um, as you make the, the, the wind turbine bigger, the rotor mass is going to scale by diameter cubed. Um, so the power goes by the area, which is diameter squared. But interestingly, the frequency of oscillations goes by diameter to the negative 1. So frequencies, like natural frequencies, which might, um, which might make resonances uh, in one size machine, are not going to be the same frequencies which make resonances in another, another machine. And in particular, the, the, the frequencies of waves forcing one size machine aren't going to affect other, other machines. So being able to do uh, rapid simulation to, to design these things is very important. Um, this movie was made with the NREL turbine uh, analysis codes. Uh, this is a barge. You can see some massive angular deflections of, of the barge <clears throat> and of the wind turbine blades. Um, and because of this work, NREL is realizing that some of the older methods, like blade element theory, uh, blade element theory uh, assumes that this rotor plane is just a plane. Um, those methods are maybe no longer uh, very, uh, very accurate for these types of uh, simulations. So NREL is starting to look at other types of methods, like these vortex methods that I've been talking about. Um, so I've pointed out a few things that, that um, NREL has you know, identified as concerns with their codes. And before I highlight them, I, I want to pay as much respect as possible to them. I think that you know, they're certainly the country's leaders in this field, and they're doing incredible work. And they've, they, they have um, certainly the best uh, analysis capabilities so far. So you know, with that said, and as much respect as possible to them, um, I'll just point out that uh, their, like I said, their aerodynamics codes um, you know, don't really model the wake. So they can't get interactions between turbines and an array. Um, and also these large angular deflections won't, won't, uh, that, that might break their codes. Um, their structural dynamic solvers that they use, um, they have two structural dynamic solvers. Atoms uh, they, um, is, is very complicated 
and they've admitted that it's pretty much an analysis tool. It's not a, it's not a design environment. You can't do design optimization in it. It's more of an analysis tool, like a CFD code would be. Um, their fast codes are, are modal-based codes, so you have to tell the code what the bending uh, modes of your, of, your, um, of your wind turbine is. Um, so it can't handle things like curved and swept blades or pitch, pitch uh, bend coupling which are things that people want to analyze currently. So I'll move real quick through this. I've, I've extended the, the, the rigid wind turbine uh, methods to do aeroelastic uh, analysis. The idea is uh, very simple. You still use the same Newton solver iterations, except for now the, uh, the, the blade shape and twist uh, are also part of the, the nonlinear system of equations that you're solving. Um, so you solve for these. You, you still solve for all the loads, but now you do so in these beam-aligned coordinate systems where you're um, all the time buried in the code. You're transforming from global X, Y, Zs to these local coordinates and so on. So in doing that, what you can come up with are um, moments and forces calculated in, in, in um, you know, tangible things like the, the moment about the spanwise direction is, is a twisting moment, and then this, this uh, moment about this axis would be the bending moment that we would learn about in structures class. <clears throat> so, so the idea, what I've been proposing, uh, is to combine this aeroelastic uh, work I've been doing with OpenProp with the code that one of my thesis advisors, Mark Durela, has made for the aeroelastic modeling of aircraft. And so by marrying these two codes, what we're hoping to do is come up with an aeroelastic turbine code uh, which could be used for this offshore floating problem. Um, so to, just to motivate this, look at this AUV. It's about to just get destroyed. Watch that. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> so it'll play again, probably. So that's called the body freedom flutter um, eigen mode. So, um, so that, that, that frequency of, of fluttering is unstable. Um, Mark's aeroelastic airplane code can capture that, and it would be able, they'd be able to use that to design their way around, uh, around that next year. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about how it works. <clears throat> so um, similar to OpenProp, uh, ASWing uses this, uh, this vortex lattice formulation. Um, it calculates forces and moments in beam-aligned coordinates. It uses uh, coordinates, a full six degree of freedom flight dynamics. So it can capture things like uh, we can have a global uh, coordinate system fixed to the Earth, and then we can, we can have a coordinate system fixed to that floating offshore platform. So we can get the dynamics of the, of the floating platform. <clears throat> and it can do both steady and unsteady calculations. Um, the formulation is, is similar to OpenProp. Uh, we don't have to go through all the math, but uh, the point being that uh, he sets up all of the entire, all of the equations for system dynamics, everything from that down to just, um, you know, just geometric constraints of this wing being attached to the body as a system of, of Newton solver residual equations. Just the same thing we, we all learned about for open prop. <clears throat> so in doing this, we can simulate both um, steady state trim flight and also an unsteady event like this airplane responding to an unsteady wind gust. So there it goes. <clears throat> this Newton solver uh, approach is really powerful because we can use that to do perturbation analysis. So let me just show you what we're getting to so we don't have to endure the math for nothing. Um, so here we have a cantilevered beam. If I pluck this, you can see how it responds. This is a free response, you know, eigen mode response of this, of this beam. So if instead I take it and I shake it like this sinusoidally, this would be a forced response. So this would be like Bode analysis. Um, so for those mathematically inclined, you've probably already worked your way through the math. Um, the, this Newton solver iteration that we had done to solve for, the, uh, for the, um, uh, what was going on on the previous slide has already yielded us these three matrices, um, which we can then use to come up with the, uh, the governing equation for these, for these perturbations. So this is, this is written in the standard form, um, which, which will allow us to then do both these eigenmode analysis and then these Bode, this Bode uh, force response analysis. 
So I'll just give you a couple of movies here to show you how this works. <clears throat> this is, a, this is a, a, a wing flutter mode for this particular aircraft. So this would be like the, the uh, flat twist mode for the, for the wind turbine. And we would be able to capture this. And then in real time, we could change the stiffness of the blades and then reanalyze these, uh, the, these, these modes to see if we still have the, the bending properties that we want and the structural modes that we want. <clears throat> this here is a, is a rigid body roll mode. So this would be like uh, the entire uh, wind turbine rotor um, you know, spinning up or spinning down, or the entire uh, platform uh, rolling in response to waves. <clears throat> For the Bode analysis, uh, this, this picture illustrates uh, the rudder forcing at a, at a pretty slow frequency, 0.2 hertz. So in that case, uh, the, the boom is stiff enough to transmit that load all the way through it and affect the trajectory of the aircraft. Um, if you were to just um, actuate your rudder at a little bit you know, faster, one hertz rudder forcing, now the compliance in, your, in the boom uh, would make it so the aircraft would track straight but just wiggle like a fish. Um, so in this way, in, in this way we could um, investigate different types of control strategies. What, what frequency are we going to be able to, to, to actuate our, our, um, our blades at? <clears throat> without, the, without the whole system um, shaking in response to that. Uh, I'll just point out that this, that this simulation was done for the Daedalus. This is the human-powered airplane that flew from Crete to Greece. So it's now hanging in the Smithsonian, I think. So some of the modeling efforts that would be involved in this project um, would, so again, we're going to try to marry these two codes. Um, some of the modeling efforts, uh, I'll just highlight two. Uh, one would be um, Representing that unsteady sea state, so how can we represent the wave uh, wave forces and waves uh, slamming against the the uh, platform um, in this in this integrated simulation environment? This type of you know, problem has been addressed before in, in floating offshore platforms, uh, but not but but never in this aeroelastic uh, environment. So I think that would be, make for a for a good uh, PhD thesis. <clears throat> Certainly, uh, some things that uh, uh, bachelor's students or just master's students just starting out could do would be uh, validating these codes versus the NREL codes, which, again, are the best that our country has to offer for now. Um, so as they're doing validation work, uh, we could then, um, or once we have this simulation tool, we could evaluate things like, you know, what are, what are good different uh, configurations of these floating offshore platforms? So you can imagine doing a, a study where we look at these different configurations of uh, buoy or tension-like platform or, or floating barge, and, and then to use these tools to best uh, design these different types of systems. All right, so with that, I'll just say thanks, and hopefully I ended on time. And uh, thanks for your attention. Yeah, that, so the, um, uh, the the blade area actually um, helps us. You know, the the long skinny blades actually help the lifting line model. The lifting line model gets more and more accurate as the blades get get uh, shorter and shorter cord lengths. So it's actually more applicable in the case of the the wind turbines as it is in the case of marine propellers. No, it's this lifting surface effects that we were talking about. Like as as your blade area gets bigger, that lifting surface effect becomes more of a, a problem you have to deal with. So it's 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 purely geometric. Um, yeah. So, yep. Another question. Yeah. Um, does the does the drag coefficient? Um, yeah, I don't know how. Uh, I, I don't know if I, I can recall any any wind tunnel tests or anything where uh, people.
people have published data of like rainy wind tunnel. Um, I would imagine that. Uh, I mean, I, I would I would venture to say, you know, not that much. I I, I don't think. I don't think that's something you would design for. What's that? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, certainly you have a two-phase flow situation there, but I mean the. Um, I mean, if part of the blade is wet, then you know, air is still going to flow over that, and you're still going to have the gross lift effects, which are, you know, that's a macroscopic effect. So, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, we go back up. I mean, so it's 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 mostly a cost issue, um, but <clears throat> but this I mean this uh, this diagram shows it pretty well. If you have if you have three blades and uh, say you have zero drag and three blades and, and you you know this this particular tip to ratio this is the best you can get. If you have a hundred blades or infinite blades and zero drag this is the best you can get. So you could. Now, you could very quickly, you know, make another plot here with two blades. And you'd see that the difference between two and three is pretty great, but the difference between three and four is not worth four times, four thirds the cost of the extra blade, and four thirds the maintenance of the extra blade. So. Yeah, the, t the 2D foil section, um, you know, design, that's a whole active field of research and I think will continue to be so for a number of years. And basically what you're trying to get at is go from um, a, a not very good foil shape might have a drag coefficient or drag to lift ratio of 0.02, whereas a really well designed, a perfectly designed airfoil has zero drag. That's, that's impossible to do. but. If you could get to zero drag, you're basically going from this turbine to this one. So as you pour more and more effort of designing better sections, you're basically just jumping from this, this design to this one and getting that much, squeaking this much extra power out. There's also the effect of one blade on the other blade of the rotor. Yeah. Yeah. Is that included in open problem? Yeah, yeah, that's completely included, and that's that's in like the helical wake geometry uh, that that all gets bundled together. So, yep. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, thank, thanks. Actually, th yeah, thanks for giving me a chance to to say that because I forgot to say that in the in the talk. What I was trying to get at with look like that that dimensional analysis slide was, you know, basically in order to get more power, you know, we're making these machines bigger and bigger and bigger. I think you know, scaling up the size has continued to prove economically advantageous, and I uh, I don't think we're at the limit of where making it bigger is going to be less economical. But in order to do that, the loads on the, on the blades are going to be higher and higher and higher. Um, and that means if you have any extra mass in your blade, you're, you're, you're wasting money. And, and then so you, you, it, it, the penalty for over-designing over your blades gets greater. But also the penalty for them breaking is greater because the machines are bigger. So, so the the current trend, which I think is going to continue for a number of years, is these b machines are going to become bigger. Um, and for that, you know, we're going to have to have more and more confidence that they're going to work right and be optimally designed. I think he had his guy out first.
Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that that is part of the code. It doesn't like you can you can model that, um, but I mean, it's not part of the example of the show. So, um, but yeah, that's that's a trivial. Uh, it, that's a trivial augmentation of the code. You just have to have non-lifting sections, where which don't produce lift, but they do produce drag. So, um, yeah. Uh, so here, Christian, then you. Sorry, sorry, one more. Yeah, no. Bet, the bets limit applies to the vertical axis ones as well, um, and but you know. The way you might construct the thrust and cork equations and then do the optimization would be different. So, um, but yeah, you can't, the Betts limit is just a one dimensional, uh, one dimensional uh, effect, so you can't get around that. So. I was just going to ask about the impact of birds and bats. <coughs> Yeah, I, I think experience has shown now that birds are smart enough to fly around them. I, I've been to conferences in in the UK, and the, I mean, people are pretty much not talking about bird strike much anymore. Uh, let me go to this question that's later on, like a, a silly question that actually is now, and then let me see what you can answer outside. Why are all those wind turbines white? Because uh, apparently <coughs> Is that a, just a, a human preference, or would it be would it be more of an eyesore if they were painted bright green or bright orange? I don't know. Yeah. 